Hello everyone, so today we're going to be reviewing Christmas ornaments. So let's just go ahead and get started. Of course, a typical Christmas ornament is generally just some sort of shiny bobble with a hook on top. And the problem is, is that many people end up designing to copy traditional type of ornaments like this, where they have a small loop at the top and this glossy outer surface that is spherical. But you don't have to, and you really shouldn't, because with 3D printing, it's a completely different process. So you want to do things a little bit differently. But let's go ahead and look at what people have made so far. Let's start right here. This spiral is actually a really beautiful shape and it's a, a fantastic design because it's very difficult to manufacture this with traditional methods. It does have a secondary area where you have a hole in the bottom. I think this design is meant to have a hole drilled in the bottom, which is a good idea because you have a very reliable hole, but it is unideal for like mass production because you're adding a secondary process, which adds to the cost of it. The other issue with this type of a design is that it comes to such a perfect point that you often end up deforming the point because as the hot material is put down, the layer below it has not had time to cool. So what you generally want to do is kind of blunt these tips so that it doesn't come to a perfect tip and you can get something really clean and smooth all the way through. There's also a little bit you could do with maybe slightly changing the angle of these first flanges, but overall this design is really beautiful and looks great when it's added to a tree there. And of course, it's done in this metallic silver, but you can do metallic red and purples and all other types of metallic colors to get that real high gloss sheen of like these kind of cheap ornaments that are like glazed with whatever they have. All right, moving on here. The star. This is actually a really cool shape because this is actually impossible to manufacture any other way too. 3D printing lets you make mechanisms that were never possible before, and you can make them all in one shot. There's no assembly. This comes off of the machine, and is done. Now, the issue with this is that since the first layer of it is so complex and has to be separated, uh, you end up with potential defects like this, where it just didn't stick to the bed and ends up kind of ruining itself because it shifts or moves or whatever it happens to be. And when you're making tens of thousands of these, you don't want this to occur. So generally a really good way to kind of fix this issue is to have like a sprue running across this core so that there's a single spine to this piece that then might be cut or snipped or broken loose uh, when this thing is spun. So that the first time the customer gets it is they ju just break loose all of the different areas and then they spin free. And that makes sure that these are not individual little islands that have to be printed. But again, the shape and the style can really be made affordably with mass production 3D printing and looks great on the tree. Alrighty, this one is actually a really cool design. It has a little bit of an issue up here. Generally, you don't want loops to be in layers. So this part prints like this. So this means that these uh, upper areas are gonna be a little bit weaker. So if this fell and landed right on its head, it would probably snap off. But these are thick enough that for a Christmas tree ornament, it's very likely that that type of a fall would never really happen and it'd probably fall on carpet. So this is decently robust and not terrible, but it's something to be aware of. But this design is great because again, really complex, really beautiful. Uh, we're using this kind of pearlescent white on it, which is a beautiful color. But this is also really special because it actually breaks in half and you can put a gift in there. So it's kind of a, a Christmas or an Easter egg sort of ornament. And you can see right here from these outer edges that the pattern actually hooks in behind and isn't just a forward facing pattern. It actually has depth and comes in. That is impossible to make with any other sorts of processes. So it's a, a really good example of an impossible geometry, a really cool application and just looks beautiful. This is a great, great design. And yeah, again, you can make it in any color and make a bajillion of them and they would be a, a fantastic product. All right, what else we got? Oh, we're getting into the, the don'ts, I can tell already. So this uh, this part has a number of issues with it. First of all, it, it, it's got the right idea because 3D printing can make really complex objects and this type of object, again, can't be made with any other process for sure because the interior can't really be removed unless you wanted to have multiple pieces and then stick them back together and so on and so forth. So that's not really a great way to do it. But the uh, number of issues are is that number one, the corners are too sharp, which creates these kind of bang bang situations where the extrude goes to the corner and then shoots off in a different direction, which can cause this sort of deformation, especially if you're making a bunch of them. And since the walls are so thin, uh, this was actually printed at a high speed setting, which means that if it can't be printed at a high speed, it would need to be slowed down, which means it gets a little bit more expensive to make. And the complexity of it just sort of causes an issue. 
generally what we recommend for something like this is number one, we change the settings, slow it down so that this is avoidable, but you wanna make sure that this is basically impossible to occur whenever designing for mass production. So you could basically make them hemispherical in the back. So basically round off the back. So it's like a, a half circle so that they're thicker and chunkier. It wouldn't really add much more material because they'd still be hollow and then round out everything else so it looks clean. Uh, the other thing to do is that this first layer has all these five little islands. That's not necessary for this. Make that a full circle and uh, that way you have a good bed interface point there and it simplifies it a bunch. Also add in a hole right there. Uh, again, doesn't need a hole drill. Um, it would be just fine as is, but basically just some refinements to this make it much more robust. And we wanted to illustrate that by actually kind of inducing the failure there. But when it's on the tree, it looks really cool. And from a product design standpoint, is really tough to make any other way. So mass producing it with 3D printing is a really good option. All right, what else we got? Um, ah, this one's kind of cool. Uh, it needs to kind of be gone over with the heat gun, but it also helps to illustrate the issues with these types of designs. So again, an impossible design, an interior figure inside of an outer kind of complex cage shape. Uh, if this was made with traditional methods, it would be pretty darn expensive because you'd have like an upper, a lower, the interior figure, um, and then you, those all have to be pressed together and like ultrasonic welded or whatever it happens to be. But it has issues with 3D printing too because it's been designed to be printed like this. The issue is, is that again, you have these really thin features with a really steep overhang so that you end up with this deformation. And yeah, you can get a lot of cooling on there, but when it's that steep, and that weird on a spherical surface, you just have layer shifting because it, basically the next layer up moves so far into space when it's just adjusted up, it moves inward really far on those steep angles. Uh, we have another video where we talk about overhangs and upper curves where we talk about this. Uh, I highly recommend checking that out for how to design this kind of stuff. But that is a feature that is just makes it really difficult to mass produce this part because there's almost no way to win. What you would want to do is maybe have something stick out of the top of the snowman's head that then merges into there or stretch this out so that it's more oval shaped rather than spherical. And that way you don't have that steep horizontal upper ceiling to the whole thing. Uh, the rest of it looks cool though. And it's a really neat concept because you can make this shape. Um, this actually looks, based on how the snowman is made, how that second ball is pressed so deep into the lower one, I'll bet it was actually probably designed with Tinkercad. It, it seems like that kind of style. This upper ring too, uh, again, totally fine for an ornament that'll be fine for forever, but it is really fragile. So you'd want to merge, at the very least, merge that base layer into it more so that it's not just that small spine in there. Basically give it a fat uh, connection point uh, to the main ornament to help a bit if you're stuck with that. But there is a better way of designing holes. And actually we haven't really seen it yet with any of these, uh, but we'll get, we'll get to it here by the end. But it's a really good kind of first attempt and a really neat concept because of that cage design. It shows how you can make something pretty complex. All right, next one. Ah, this one's cool. So this is just a neat shape, um, very neat shape here. It looks really cool. You have the upper loop that looks great and so on. Uh, again, a really fragile upper loop that you want to be aware of. Again, make it as thick or as chunky as you possibly can so that it's not fragile. You can hang something from it, but as soon as somebody packs it in a box, your ornaments are going to break. So you don't want to mass produce something like this. You want something much more robust. Uh, I would have recommended putting a hole straight through this upper cylinder. That would have been beefy enough to do it, but it could be made even more than that. Something cool here is that as it comes up to the point, you can see kind of a color change. That is from heat concentration. So these lower layers had more time to cool. And then up here, the printer is going so fast that it basically keeps all the layers below it semi-molten, which sort of changes the color and the sheen of it. And we can actually use that process in order to sort of change how matte or how glossy a part is. But what's really cool about this ornament, it has this accordion lower, which it's a really neat thing because you have these parts that are too large to fit through the hole inside of this piece because they are all printed as one single print. So basically you have this assembly that is grown all at once. So you don't have to have post assembly and you can make impossible shapes where you have a large part inside of a small hole effectively here. The danger with this kind of stuff is that this has really thin walls. So if we scale this down to this little metallic one like this, this little red one, then you can end up with this type of deformation. And this is something to avoid. So you have to be aware of the overall size of your 
a part and where it can be ideally mass produced. Otherwise you end up with all kinds of weird uh, artifacts like this or just unmanufacturable. This is so thin that it can never really reliably adhere to the bed on the first layer. So it causes too much deformation and too many failures. Whereas this larger diamond one, this purple one, is just about the right size and creates a really good result that looks really pretty. Um, yeah, the one comment would be improve that upper loop there. And you've got a really interesting ornament that looks really great and again has a really cool color. All right, next one up. So this is uh, an interesting conversation because these spikes around here are designed support. And this is a really good idea. Design support is always almost optimal because what it does is it lets you put the minimum amount of support right where it's needed. Uh, if you send us just a part that needs support, then you end up with us either using auto-generated or design supports that are sub-optimal. You as the designer know best where this part has features that need to be protected. But these can also be stupidly easy removed. This could basically be thrown in a tumbler and all of these supports would fall off. So it's a way better way of making support. And you end up with this beautiful complex design and the supports help to aid with the cooling, help to aid with the stiffness of it. And it's just a gorgeous model. And you can see that each one of these splines is three dimensional, like the interior isn't smooth or something. So this could not be made any other way. And then this hole up here is in this nice blended upper loop. There's no way I can knock that off. It'll never break off, but it's just a beautiful little addition there and it'll spin and this is also a design that can be scaled up and scaled down pretty well and still be made pretty darn affordably. It will use a reasonable amount of material um, and a reasonable amount of print time because again, the surface of it is so complex and you always want to minimize surface area if you're trying to minimize cost of a part. But for this, a premium Christmas ornament like this often sells for like eight bucks. I was just in Target the other day looking at them and that's about what they were selling for, which means it has to be manufactured for about two to three and this most certainly could be done. And it's just a great design. It's optimized, it'll print well, and it looks beautiful, it's robust, all of this. This is, this is a fantastic design. All right, now it's all well and good that we go ahead and talk about other people's designs, but how would we actually make an ornament? Well, to start off, we just made a perfect sphere. This of course is the traditional, everybody's happy about this. What we did was we designed it to be printed where the holes are, which means that you have a very strong connection point right here. And what we did, rather than making a through hole, what we actually did is make a loop. So you design a circle over here and then you rotate it around and you get this nice little hoop all the way through to where you can take a nice piece of wire and run it through the whole part of the ornament. We did not do any sort of texturing or anything at all. We let a seam be present here on the back which is not always ideal. Generally, we try to spread it around. And for a part like this, we might do something along the lines of a uh, fuzzy skin or something like that, because it creates a nice rumpled surface that also gives a lot more specularity. This is actually a red. When you have these big, broad surfaces like this, you end up sometimes changing the color because in this big old white space, you don't have the, the pungency of the red that comes from like these things when you have textures and shapes to break it up and kind of let the red sit. But the issue with the circle is really the overhang. So when it's printed like this, you have this overhang right here, which is so steep that it causes some deformation at the bottom. That deformation at the bottom can be fixed if you don't have it as steep. And one way of doing that is to flatten out the top anymore, basically cut it in further. We have a whole fillets video where we talk about this type of lower edge curving but in this case, you don't want to change the, the sphere. You want it to be as round as possible. So we try to make this as small as possible, but it does get you. And in mass production, this isn't ideal. Though if we were using like a spiralized face mode for this type of a ball, not only would we make it cheaper, we'd also be able to kind of help with that because there's not as much material density to where to cause that sort of deformation. But another solution is to just eliminate that angle altogether. And to do that, what you would do is you would take that ornament and make it somewhat like this, where you take the circle and you spread it out. Now you have this nice little bobble that can hang just like that, and it looks great. And now you no longer have that overhang issue on the bottom, even though you still have that really robust connection point. Now the issue with this is, is that it comes all the way up to a perfect point, which we mentioned before is an ideal. We'd want to blunt that a little bit more. But since this point is not quite as long, you can almost sneak away with it. And here we're using a pearlescent white because it just looks really, really good. And again, generally you'd want to break up the surface with some kind of texturing to make this both more interesting 
and uh, allow it to be more robust in mass production. With a big old broad surface, any single defect could become an issue. But now you also have the advantage of 3D printing in general, which is that you can create all kinds of different shapes and designs without incurring new tooling or molding costs. So as soon as you have these base shapes and this base attachment point, you can now start creating all kinds of other designs that are really beautiful and really unique. And as customers give you more feedback, you can change and create what they're actually looking for. So these ornaments are a great example of how to use 3D printing and mass production 3D printing to create some really original and beautiful types of designs that aren't always possible with other types of manufacturing, are way more flexible, and lets you create products that had never existed before, but look really beautiful and really add to the season and allow you to differentiate your products from what other people may be creating out there with traditional methods. This new manufacturing technology lets you create something that has never existed before and cannot exist again because you were able to create faster than you've ever been able to create before. Basically, you're able to create products at the speed of thought. Merry Christmas and have a great year, everybody.